Well, hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe video. I'm recording here from the uh, office in New York City and I have a lot of things on my cover. I want to say that I'm going to be totally off script here today in terms of the subject matter of the video is going to largely revolve around this week in the market and particularly some updated thoughts around the China trade war, etc. Whereas the written Dividend Cafe this week covers some of these things, but actually delves in a whole lot of different areas that I don't think are going to work for the video. And so it may just be one of those weeks you might want to watch both or listen to both. The Dividend Cafe podcast will be more like the, the commentary. But I, I, I get into some more timeless principle stuff this week there that I'd written earlier in the week that is very, very important to me. It's one of my favorite Dividend Cafes I've ever written. And it has to do with some of the more permanent theses around uh, investor behavior um, as a uh, uh, predominant variable in an investor outcome. And then delve into some long-term thinking around the indebtedness of not only our country, but indeed the whole world. And what that means, this kind of large debt overhang, which is a topic that I think comes up all the time and should come up all the time, um, for investors, uh, as we look out a couple of years and in fact a couple of decades, it's a long-term issue. And I don't think it gets enough coverage. And so I gave a lot of coverage there at Dividend Cafe and if you're up for two bouts of input from me, either the podcast in the video or the commentary in the video, this might be a week to do it. Because what I'm going to talk to you all about now, those of you that are kind of watching or listening to this video uh, to get your weekly fix of, of this uh, stuff, is in fact right now we're, uh, we're down about 400 points, a little less than 400 as I'm recording in the Dow. Now, we had entered today, Thursday, um, up on the week, and and now we've gone negative on the week uh, with the drop here today. Um, and, and I think that most people know that the market had dropped to some degree when it was clear that the China trade deal that we thought was about to come was not going to come. And, and then it sort of was accelerating its losses, but then it made all those losses back up, and then it kind of moved even higher from there. And then now we're down, uh, like I said, 400, and we, we see where things go. I mean, it's early in trading on Thursday, and uh, uh, you know, going into the holiday weekend, it could get much worse going into Friday afternoon. Could It could uh, reverse back the other way, which it's done many times, by the way, in the last couple of weeks where you have a bad sell-off in the morning and then recovery throughout the day. I don't have a forecast on it, and I certainly don't have an interest in it. It's immaterial to the way I would view these things. If you're wondering when this volatility is going to end, I would encourage you to stop wondering because it's not going to end as long as the uncertainty around where this trade outcome and and so forth is going, the tariffs, um, as long as that uncertainty lingers, the, the volatility is almost assured to linger. And how low it can go and how high it can go and how uh, you know quick the back and forth action could be, I, you know, we can't measure or forecast that magnitude. But my expectation is that each day they're talking about something you know around China and trade and some days it looks a little better and we're up a couple hundred points at the open and other days we're down a couple hundred points. Almost all the activity is taking place after hours. These are things being priced in at the point the market opens. People have virtually no chance of trying to trade around it because the market is opening at a gap up to where it closed the day before or a gap down. And that's if you don't understand that, that's a question you could email me about. I could explain a little better. But my point is the market does not open. I assume everyone knows this, but I, may, I shouldn't assume that. The market does not open where it closed the day before. That's what the futures market attempts to try to bake in. And so to the degree that sentiment or some tweets or announcements or news developments or whatever the case may be, take place in between 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern and, and 9.30 a.m. Eastern the next day, you know, those things are going to create a gap in distinction between a market close and market open. So it really can't be timed. It can't be traded, um, nor should it be, because I think that we are in a situation 
where the tension will persist that uh, at some point uh, the the pain gets bad enough for one or both parties that a negotiation can kind of come together. And I don't really know why it would happen before then. I, I there's It would seem to me these are pretty serious players on both sides of the equation. And if the pain points do not get hit, they can afford to kind of stand their ground a little longer. That would be my take on it. Okay. So as far as timing on the volatility goes, uh, could I see it being four or five weeks? I would very much expect it to be another four or five weeks. Could it be four or five months? It's entirely possible. Um, if someone just said, David, you have to tell us, what do you think will end up happening over the next you know, short horizon? Um, my best guess, which I would not invest around, which I would not predict or place a bet on, but if I was you know, forced to answer this, okay? I would guess that they'll end up doing another ceasefire where there is some sort of uh, uh, communication between President Trump and President Xi at the G20 in June where they say, OK, let's go ahead and hold off on that additional tariffing of $350 billion of Chinese exports of imports into the U.S. Um, let's put that on hold. And then we'll go back to the drawing board and we're renegotiating. And the market will respond favorably to the idea that uh, an acceleration of tariffs is off the table and that there's some sign of, of re-engagement. Uh, uh, it would not need to mean it's going to go end the right way. It would not mean that um, there's some even you know optimistic encouragement that they're close to a deal. But it would just mean that you know they, they kind of agree to not make the thing get worse. And I think that that's what right now what perhaps the market's starting to say is, okay, well, it looks like that uh, increase from 10% tariffing to 25% on the $200 billion of products currently coming into America from China, looks like that's going to maybe go forward. But that $350 billion, is that going to happen? The, the president uh, has threatened. And I don't think the market has believed it will. But each day that goes by, it becomes somewhat more likely in theory. So some ceasefire uh, probably calms and soothes markets in a bit. And, and with that might provide a little um, dampening of the day-to-day -day volatility. So I, I uh, continue to believe that there will be a resolution. And I continue to believe there will not be one easy. That it will come when there's a pain point that gets hit. And um, the war, it, it, if we were closer to the election right now, if and there was some kind of you know better way to handicap what people thought, certainly a year and a half is just way too much time for anyone to be able to appropriately discount the likelihood of a particular political outcome. But as we were to get closer, there may potentially be a bit more clarity. If everything's very close in the polling. Um, as you get closer to election, it becomes totally uncertain. But, you know, if you had some just significant advantage to one candidate or the other, uh, but this far out, it would be impossible. I mean, of course, they don't even, the Chinese don't even know who the president's going to run against. Um, and people, I, I don't want to go down the political path, but my point being, um, there's a game of chicken going on, okay? There really is. And it's important because both sides, um, have a lot riding on what could happen at the end of 2020 and it behooves uh, uh, both sides to get a deal done um, I think in advance of that if there's any ambiguity about the way the outcome will go. So uh, as far as the expectation of volatility I expect to continue as far as the actions coming out of the volatility I would expect very little. We um, have certain positions that we're monitoring that when they hit certain prices, we want to come back in and be a buyer just to take advantage of dips that we think give a, a strategically more attractive uh, entry to add to the positions. Um, very little of that has been hit so far. Uh, there are a couple of things that we added to the week before last. Um, surprisingly, some of the drug companies have done so well even through this uh, market sell-off that we actually added 
uh, excuse me, subtracted from a position this week, uh, just kind of trimming some profits in the drug sector. So, uh, I, I, but we're keeping our macro allocations where they are for the very reason I've been talking about for a few weeks now, that we don't have any reason to believe that things are about to decelerate uh, to a magnitude that would warrant us getting even more defensive than we are. Um, that's different than the volatility we're expecting. But then we also think that it'd be very difficult to take an exceedingly bullish position right now, knowing the volatility will continue and knowing that there is, even if a small amount, some risk that has to be priced into your consideration um, that this is a prolonged and perhaps much worse macroeconomic event. Now, what could make it a worse macroeconomic event? And, and you probably know the word I'm about to utter, but it is CapEx. And the industrial production number has been falling now for seven months in a row after all of the acceleration it had enjoyed in the first part of Trump's administration. What we're making in factories is still growing, but it's growing at a decreasing rate month by month. Um, barely positive number in April. And I think that the uh, business investment numbers are showing signs of be either being paused, held, or, or abandoned uh, around fear trepidation of the trade war. And my fear is not just that that continues, uh, but that even when the trade war ends, that it, it could potentially end up being too late. That, that businesses make capital allocation decisions around what they know then, and they can't just sit there and hold their entire strategic alignment financially um, uh, on hold while they wait for a political de event to develop. So I really do think that there's a lot on the line to getting a resolution, not in the next uh, two years, but in the next two months, four months, you know, the, something along those lines. And, and so our macroeconomic uh, outlook continues to be positive for all the same reasons it's been positive with low unemployment and wage growth um, and, and growing GDP as a result of a better business environment, uh, lower taxes, lower regulation. And yet the thesis of that being able to continue and extend the market economic cycle is jeopardized right now by the trade war. And that's the thing that we have to be watching the most why I think this is a timing, uh, you know, sensitive issue. Uh, so I think that's all I wanted to say about the trade in China related matters. Um, as I mentioned, awful lot about long term debt, Federal Reserve, interest rates. You know, there is more talk. I'll, I'll give you this here now. There is more talk that the Fed is perhaps growing in likelihood of cutting rates based on the enhanced uncertainty that this trade war is representing. And I, and I think it's possible. I certainly hope they do not. And the reason I hope they do not is uh, not because I don't think it could potentially be a sugar high in the market, but um, I think it would exacerbate what ultimately becomes the biggest risk outstanding in the market. And that is the corporate debt ratios, uh, which all are totally fine when the economy is good. But when the economy faces some distress, whether that were in a month or whether it were in three years, the sensitivity in the business sector to economic distress just gets more and more heightened as there's more and more debt and leverage ratios, uh, more and more leverage in the, in the corporate economy. And a lower rate environment, I think, would incentivize an a re, a, a acceleration of that re-leveraging that I think would add embedded risk into the market. So that would be a concern I'd have if the Fed were to go forward with a rate cut. But they seem to be posturing towards to just kind of sit on their hands and do nothing. And, and not only is that what I continue to expect, um, it's what I hope they will do. Now, if, if you said what, from a probability standpoint, I think it's far more probable the next move will be a cut than a hike. Um, but that doesn't mean I am forecasting a cut at this time. Uh, but admittedly, those odds have gotten higher that there will be a cut by the end of the year than they were, say, a month ago. Uh, so we continue to watch that. And that's, I think, the reasoning going on. The Fed would say, no, 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 we don't need to do anything because, yeah, inflation has collapsed and we want it to be a little higher. But we believe it will be higher because we think that drop in inflation expectations 
was transitory. So we think inflation is getting back up to 2%. Well, that if if the Fed's thinking were were really centered around that, then I would say, okay, well, I think they're going to be uh, very surprised and unpleasantly so that the deflationary pressures prove not to be transitory. I do not believe that the reason uh, inflation uh, expectations are so low is simply something that they're going to be able to get rid of here through time. Um, However, I think the Fed is just as aware as I am about the concerns with uh, an additional buildup of risk in the corporate economy. And so whatever benefits they think they'd get by manufacturing some inflation, none of which, by the way, I believe is even possible that they could do. Um, I, but then I think they would fear that that benefit would be offset by uh, the risk of an additional leverage in in the uh, particularly in the senior loan market. So uh, there's a tug of war about what to do around that, and and there we are. Okay, read dividendcafe.com. Hope you've enjoyed the video. Email me with any questions you have, and send this video around to anyone you'd like, uh, and write us a review or or just a thumbs up or something. I mean, how hard can that be? Just hit like on YouTube. Um, and of course, if you didn't like it, you can hit dislike, but that I don't really want you to do that. So I got to let you go back to work. We go. Thank you for listening to the Dividend Cafe video. And we uh, wish you a very, very wonderful Memorial Day weekend with your friends and family.